I'm a social psychologist and I'm going to talk about mechanism and process. That's the kind of thing we social psychologists like to talk about. And specifically, I'm going to talk about what is perhaps the dominant concept in explanations of collective behaviour and collective emotion. And in fact, this concept of contagion is sometimes treated as, uh, sometimes equated with collectivity and collective behaviour itself. It is so pervasive and so influential. And uh, it is a distinctive concept compared to other concepts, other ways of talking and thinking about social influence in social psychology compared to like conformity, minority influence, leadership and so on. Um, it tends to be associated with uh, suggesting that influence is passive, that it's simple, that it occurs just through touch. I mean, that's what the word means, through touch. That is how uh, influence occurs. And um, the origins, uh, or the first use of the term contagion in a social scientific context can be traced to the work of uh, Hippolyte Tard in his psychohistory of the French Republic when he applied various concepts from medicine to understand crowd behaviour, uh, not only contagion itself but also feverishness, delirium. It was employed by Tard and as we've heard it was popularised by Le Bon who explained it as an effect of suggestion and defined it as a process of uncritical social influence, suggesting that anybody, once they get become part of the crowd, anybody is susceptible to this uncritical social influence. Since that time, the concept of contagion has spread to all sorts of areas. Uh, we did a a Google Scholar search with the words contagion, uh, and we found over 500 hits for 2015 alone. And 99% of these were social science uh, papers. They weren't anything to do with, literally to do with diseases. And the concept has actually spread to multiple disciplines, not just psychology, social psychology, but marketing, public opinion research, sociology, animal behavior studies, economics, public health, and many more. And if one looks at the types of behaviour and phenomenon that the concept is used to try to explain, one finds such a range of, of, uh, of behaviour and, and topics. Itching, smiling, clapping, anxiety, excitement, obesity, health behaviour, smoking, suicide. From very simple responses like yawning when somebody else yawns to very complex phenomena such as the behaviour of the financial markets, such as collective disorder and a spread of conflict. Um, but... Um, as well as this spread to all these different topics, um, contagion has also remained a mainstay of explanations for the spread of aggression and violence. It always pops up when we, when we seek to explain violence and aggression. Violence and aggression between individuals, interpersonal, within crowds, and uh, violence and aggression between crowd events as, as riots spread across locations. All these different... Uh, phenomena apparently explained with the same mechanism. And we saw an example of this. Uh, we heard yesterday about the 2011 riots and we did see the use of the concept of contagion and related uh, concepts like copycat in the 2011 English riots. Uh, ex explaining or attempting to explain the way they started in Tottenham and Hackney and went to Ealing and Clapham and Birmingham and Liverpool and Salford. And if you look at the academic literature on the riots, some authors are using the term contagion in a rather loose way, as a kind of gloss. Um, I've got an example there on the slides. Davis et al. presented a mathematical model uh, a computer model, a computer simulation of the spread of the riots. And they were using the term contagion in this rather loose way. They talked about an apparently contagious, the apparently contagious nature of participation, a contagion-like mechanism. So you've got that, but you've also got other people using the term contagion to explain the English riots, much more committed to contagion as a mechanism and making full use of that metaphor. In fact, saying it's not just a metaphor, it's much more than a metaphor. And Gary Slutkin is a good example of that. He uh, wrote a number of articles following the riots, 
um, explaining how it's contagious, comparing it very explicitly to a disease. Violence is an academic, epidemic, he says, one that behaves with the characteristics of an infectious disease. That violence is an epidemic is not a metaphor, it is a scientific fact. And the apparent usefulness of the contagion concept in this work is uh, apparently demonstrated by the fact that Gary Slutkin has a program of violence reduction based upon the contagion concept. Um, so we could say that because of its, its use in the explanation of violence, collective behaviour and emotion, because of its spread across different kinds of phenomena, different kinds of disciplines, because of its use in practical programmes of reducing violence, Contagion is a highly successful concept. Um, we use it in everyday life as well as in, uh, in academia. However, I'm seeking to persuade you today that it is actually not a very useful concept, that it disguises more than it explains, uh, that it's not helpful, that it explains so much that it explains, that it explains nothing. Um, and my critique has two parts. The first part I call a discursive ideological part, which is quite short. And then I've got uh, an empirical part to the critique, which is uh, the beginning of a program of research work that we're doing, uh, Clifford and Steve and I, to present an alternative account of how uh, violence and conflicts and other behaviours spread from individual to individual, um, within crowds, between crowds, um, in this kind of involuntary way. So let me begin then with this, uh, what I call this discursive ideological critique, which has two steps. And the discursive part, the first step, what we do when we do discourse analysis, we have a technique where we say, well, what does the use of this term buy you? What does it give you that other terms, other concepts, um, other terminology would not give you? What, what's different about it? What it buys you, I would suggest, over terms, which you might use instead, more neutral terms, such as influence or spread, is that it pathologizes, which means it likens influence to an illness, which is precisely what Taine was trying to do. Um, and therefore, it suggests that influence is something bad. And therefore, usually also, it suggests that influence is something automatic and mindless. And if that is the case, if one believes that, then there's a certain logic there, a logic that you find in Taine and Le Bon and all those people, that therefore one might want to suppress that influence process because it's dangerous. So that's the discursive critique. And the second part then is the ideological critique. And so that is the step of asking who benefits from using that concept and, and, uh, and creating those effects through using that language in whose interests when there is collective violence, when there is a controversial conflict, in whose interests is it, is it to characterise that conflict, that behaviour, as pathological? Is it in the interest of those in power or is it in the interest of those who are trying to create uh, change and challenge that power? So that was my, uh, my first part of the critique. And then the main part and the rest of what I'm going to be talking about today is uh, the empirical critique, some evidence. First of all the existing evidence, and then I'll move on to some new evidence from some, some, uh, some new studies that we've been carrying out. Um, so the empirical critique um, focuses on the finding that there are group boundaries to influence, group boundaries that the concept of contagion cannot in itself explain. Um, now this was uh, observed quite a long time ago when Milgram and Tock in their review of crowd theories and their observations, their reported observations of some of the uh, crowd conflicts in, uh, in the United States in the 1960s pointed out that when you see a conflict in a crowd, when you see violence in a crowd, um, it doesn't spread or the same behaviour doesn't spread from the rioters to the police officers. Um, why is it? that the right, the right police are impervious to the influence of the demagogue and the behaviour spreading through the crowd. The police might be violent, but it's a different kind of violence, a different kind of behaviour than the behaviour of the crowd. Um, a similar observation, extending that point, was made by Steve in his classic study of the St Paul's riot in 1984, who noted that when rioters, when individuals threw stones at the police, everybody joined in. 
But when somebody threw a stone at a bus, they didn't. So not every action is joined in with, and more than this, not everybody is a source of influence. Um, so there are dimensions to these boundaries. Um, now, more recently, this idea that there are group boundaries based on social identities has been developed in uh, work on so-called emotional contagion. Now, work on so-called emotional contagion is one of the main areas where um, research is carried out on using the concept of contagion. But here we find, interestingly, a number of studies finding group boundaries. I'm just going to tell you about one, because it's quite clear, by van der Schalk et al. And they used uh, a number of different methodologies. And they found that when in-group members, they manipulated the identity of the, t of the target person that people were observing. And they found that when that target was an in-group member, people were more influenced by um, their emotions, their anger and their fear, than when that target was an out-group member which doesn't make sense if it's touch alone. They also found that in-group and out-group targets produce different emotions in uh, those being influenced. So when the out-group was, uh, was angry, that evoked fear in the participants. When the out-group was fearful, that evoked aversion in the in-group participants. Now, if you take all those points together, it points towards a rather different way of thinking about the relationship between social influence and groupness. Um, because the contagion argument by people such as Provine, who studies yawning, and he says that yawning and the way that yawns spread between people tell us something about, about human nature and about the evolution of sociality. He says that it's contagion that creates sociality, contagion that creates the group. Um, but this evidence suggests it's actually the other way round, um, that it's collectivity that is the basis for, and, 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 and group bonds that are, ba are the basis for influence. So these ideas are based upon uh, an extension of the, uh, the stuff that Steve was talking about yesterday, the concept of social identity, that we don't simply have personal identities, we also have social identities which are collective, which are multiple, which are variable which vary according to context. Um, and if that's cr the case, then the relevance of the target, the, the extent to which the other is actually relevant for me is an extension of myself, is the basis of my looking to them to, uh, to, to, uh, to infer how I should behave. That is the hypothesized mechanism in the model I'm uh, seeking to persuade you of. So um, what I'm going to do for the rest of the presentation is tell you about uh, some preliminary evidence that we've kind of put together to test some of those ideas. Now, uh, social psychologists do, lot, do experiments. That is our, uh, our usual methodology. I'm going to describe to you an experiment. So not everyone is probably um, familiar with lab experiments, so let me say a word or two about them. This isn't a study of an actual crowd. This is a study of an analogue of a crowd, if you like. And this is, this is a, a characteristic method in social psychology. And the method and the design that I'm going to des describe to you is one based upon a standard and well uh, established paradigm used in the behavioural aggression literature. Uh, it's based upon a study by a bloke called Wheeler, who in the 1960s published loads of stuff on um, the behavioural contagion of aggression and violent behaviour. And he used this kind of paradigm, where you've got, you test one or two individuals at a time, you've got a stimulus which is thought to uh, influence people, and then you've, you've also got some kind of provocation or, 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 or instigation before you measure the extent to which people express aggression or, or violence. That's the basic paradigm. Um, so uh, in this study, the, uh, the aggression, the, sorry, the, the violent aggressive stimulus is the noise of a crowd. Because in the, in, according to the, these models of contagion, what could be more contagious than a crowd and in particular, its expression of emotion. So our stimulus is this aggressive crowd noise, and we've got three hypotheses. The first is that where that aggressive noise is understood by participants as out-group, participants will display less 
aggression than when they see it as in-group in response. The second hypothesis is that effect, that simple effect, will be much stronger um, where participants identify with the categories that we've, uh, we've got them to, uh, we've imposed upon them. Okay, so where they don't identify, then they, they won't be influenced. And thirdly, the mechanism of influence is, as I said earlier, self-relevance. The extent to which they see that target as relevant for me, that will be the process through which this influence occurs. So um, we ran this study on Sussex students, and the relevance of that will become apparent in a moment. And we had these three conditions corresponding to the, the, uh, uh, the, the ideas I've been saying. So first of all, this source is presented as in-group to self, presented as out-group to self, or a control condition in which there is no information, an undefined target. So let me talk you through the story, this is the procedures, and I'm going to talk about this in detail because it will help you make sense of, 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 of the results. So when we recruited people, when we brought them to the, to the stimulus and to the lab, we said this is actually an experiment about sound perception. It's about crowd noise, but it's about sound perception. So that is a cover story to uh, not tell them exactly what's going on here. And we said, as part of this cover story, previous research has demonstrated that there are group differences, differences between groups in their ability to detect, perceive, and recall crowd noises. And so we introduced the idea of groups. And then the manipulation. Um, so for the uh, in-group condition, we say, so it's about groups, and in this study we're looking at the differences in noise detection between students and non-students, and you're a student, so this is how you're being tested in contrast to this other group. And this is a way of making the student identity salient to people, imposing that identity, which is meaningful to people because they are Sussex students. And the second condition, we have a more inclusive, narrower version of that same identity, because we say we're comparing Sussex students to Brighton students. And Brighton, by the way, is uh, another university in the same town, which in some context is outgroup to our participants. And in the third condition, where the target is undefined, we say it's simply a study of noise detection. So having carried out the mani that manipulation, right, which I'll say a bit more about in a second, we then give them a questionnaire. We use questionnaire items, and the questionnaire item said, being a member of this group, Sussex students or students, is important to me, okay, which is a measure of identification strength. Um, then we, inter we, uh, we expose them to the noise, which I want to play you now. We expose them to this noise. That is um, an edited, edited together set of um, recordings of the student protests in London in 2010, which were violent on occasion. And we kind of pre-tested the extent to which participants would see this as violent by asking people how aggressive, violent does this sound, and it came out very high. So we play them that sound. Let me go back to the PowerPoint. played in that sound, and then we started taking our measures, which I need to say a little bit about. First of all, another questionnaire measure, a self-relevance, a single item. The people in this soundtrack were relevant to me, agree or disagree on a scale. Then we had, we had two measures of aggression, and the reason is aggression, as you can imagine, is not something that people would necessarily want to express in a laboratory. It's got... Uh, there's an issue of social desirability. People might not want to um, express aggressive sentiment. So we've got two kinds of measures. One which is explicit, in which we ask people how aggressive they feel, and one which is implicit, in which you, the participants couldn't see what we were measuring. So let me tell you about the explicit one first. These are, again, established measures of, of aggressive behaviour and, and, uh, and feeling aggressive. 
We presented it, though, as a, as a, um, a cognitive style test to fit in with the, with the cover story. And you've got this little scenario, which is a, a vignette. You're um, in a bar. Somebody bumps into your drink. What are you going to do about it? They bump into your drink, then walk towards you aggressively. What are you going to do about it? Right? And there's a list of choices. Um, I may hit this person. I may confront this person. I may argue with this person. And the participants uh, respond on a scale of one to seven degree disagree. Okay, so that's the explicit measure. And then the implicit measure, which is called a, uh, an IAT, which is an implicit association test. This is a reaction time test, and it's more often used in cognitive psychology. It's also used in prejudice research, because there's another area where people don't want to express certain kinds of attitudes. And it's a way of getting at underlying beliefs or attitudes uh, separate from people's conscious awareness. So people have to respond to a reaction time test. Grouping items um, that refer to self or other, such as me, I, you, they, with peaceful or aggressive items, uh, words. Okay? And then the score is the, is the speed at which they group these items. And the thing operationalizes in terms of a, a negative score. So anything below zero is operationally aggressive. Anything above zero is operationally peaceful. That's the procedure. Let me tell you about the results. So this is a table of correlations and means. And if you look at the ones I've bolded, you can see... Uh, that explicit aggression and implicit aggression correlate, which is what you want. You want your explicit measure and your implicit measure to vary in the same way, because then you can be confident they're picking up the same thing. Okay, so it's negative because, as I said, implicit aggression is operationalized as below zero, negative. Self-relevance also correlates with both the aggression items, and so the basics are in place for the tests I'm going to tell you about the tests that we carried out. And the first test is to simply compare the three conditions on explicit aggression. And what this figure shows you is that people were less likely to, significantly less likely to report aggression in the, when the source was outgroup than when the source was in-group, and significantly likely less, less likely when the source was this undefined than control. No significant difference between control and in-group. So that's the explicit, explicit measure. Then the IAT, which is the, the more powerful measure. And you can see that for the in-group, um, they're below zero. So that is operationally uh, aggressive. And it's significantly different than when the uh, target was out-group. Um, uh, no significant difference, again, between the undefined and the in-group. A significant difference between out-group and, and undefined. So that's, that's the first hypothesis, that there is a significant difference between conditions. And then unpacking that to look at process a bit more, I said that this effect would be stronger when people identify with a category. So for those who you put into the student group or the Sussex group who don't really care about being Sussex or student, right, you shouldn't get the effect. For those who do care, who think, well, being a Sussex student, it's important to me, that effect should be stronger, it should be significant. And that is precisely what this figure shows. What we've done here, what the analysis does, is it divides the sample into three groups. Those who identify very strongly, those who identify weakly, and those in the middle. And those who identify only weakly, there's no effect. Our manipulation had no effect. For those who identify very strongly, there's a sharp, uh, a sharp uh, line showing that the manipulation had a significant effect. That's explicit aggression. And then the same thing for implicit aggression, the IAT, when people weren't really aware of what was being examined. Once again, for people that didn't really care about the student or Sussex identity, there was no effect. When people did care, when it was part of their identity, there was this strong effect. Then the final part of, the, of this analysis is to look at mechanism again through this concept of self-relevance because I said self-relevance is a mechanism. Self-relevance, the fact that this target person is someone I should look to, to to guide my own conduct is the process through which influence occurs. What this figure shows you is that the manipulation condition predicted aggression uh, for explicit aggression, you've seen that already, but it also worked indirectly through self-relevance. So in English, the way that manipulation in-group or out-group, affected, effect uh, affected aggression expressed is through the extent to which 
that target is seen as relevant to me. And the same thing uh, for implicit aggression. So whichever way you measure it, you're getting the same result. Um, just to summarise then. 25 minutes or five minutes? 25. Oh, 25, okay. Okay. So the out-group noise led to less... When it was out-group noise, it led to less aggression than when it was in-group noise. For both explicit and implicit measures, which gives us some confidence that it's picking up something real. These effects were stronger for people who cared about the, the category that it meant something to. And this influence operated through self-relevance. On top of this... Um, I think the fact that there was no significant difference between the undefined group and the uh, in-group uh, target is important. Because you might say to me, well, um, that's all very interesting, but you've got decades and decades of experiments like Wheeler and others showing that contagion works, right? That people simply see any target, right, and they, and they copy them. So how do you explain that? Well, I think this go some way towards explaining that, because I think what this might show, or this, what this might suggest, is that when you've got an undefined target, the participant will treat it as in-group. Or put differently, unless you say that that target is not self-relevant, is an out-group, the, the, the participant will treat them as in-group, particularly when you run an experiment. So um, this is just the beginning of a program, as I said, um, and we're mostly going to be applying this to the spread of aggression and violence because that is where the arguments lie. But I think it's important to show that the underlying mechanism is, is, is not... Um, well, that contagion is not a concept that can explain the underlying mechanism and therefore to show that other kinds of behaviours can be explained with the same kind of process as I've been talking about. And so we've been uh, trying this with other behaviours. This um, couple of slides here is an example from a study we carried out on itching. So well, again, we took an existing paradigm, which was used in a sort of neuroscience study, actually, where we showed participants these people itching themselves, scratching themselves, and in fact, here, we even told them that it's a study about itching. We didn't even disguise what was going on here. And we found that people in the in-group condition, when we told the target it was a Brighton University student, were more likely to feel itchy, were more likely to scratch themselves, to scratch themselves more often. And again, we found this, well, a slightly different pathway, but we found a pathway from self-relevance and number of scratches through feeling itchy. So um, let me conclude by... Um, Coming back to the sort of broader significance of, of, these, uh, of these ideas and away from the minute of the data. So what I've been arguing is that contagion is a problematic way to conceptualise these passive social influence processes. There are, so empirically there are social group boundaries and we're suggesting that there is, um, it's not a mindless process. There's thought involved and um, your category membership seems to matter and identity relevance is a mechanism. Then you might say another objection is, well, if you look at the, all the different versions of a contagion that are out there, because there's so many, then haven't many of them also introduced a number of different conditions, which is absolutely true. Lots of them, particularly in psychology, have a whole range of different conditions, um, such as disinhibition and cognition and so on and so forth. The answer to that is, well, if you start doing that, then what is actually left of the concept? Nothing, because what, as I said earlier with the discursive critique, what contagion gives you is a certain way of thinking about influence which is mindless, which is uh, like a disease. And so all the time you undermine that, you're actually telling us that contagion is not a useful concept in itself. And as I said earlier, contagion is being used to do so many things that it actually doesn't do anything. It doesn't really explain anything. It, at best, it simply redescribes, and at worst, it redescribes by pathologizing. And so my conclusion is that we actually need a different language, we need different concepts to talk about passive social influence. In a neutral sense, we should be talking about influence, we should be talking about spread rather than contagion, we should be talking about transmission, and in terms of mechanism, we should be talking about social identification. Okay. Okay, so, um, well, 
Uh, thanks for inviting me and uh, for the opportunity to um, present some of our work here. Um, I'll be talking about um, my understanding of collective emotions and what I've been trying to do is, um, uh, yeah, in fact, trying to synthesize works that I've been doing on the social and cultural construction of emotion um, that have been, or that work, um, I, I did that without specifically having in mind um, the ways in which those things could be understood as forms of collective emotions. But at some point it occurred to me um, that uh, what I'm in fact doing is looking at different kinds or different aspects um, of collective emotions. And so what I try to do is make sense uh, of the ways in which or what those things have in common and whether they can in fact be understood as different parts um, of uh, collective emotions. And this is what I, um, I would, what I would like to share with you today. So when we um, uh, commonly hear um, the term collective emotions as it is used in the general public but also um, in scientific discourse, um, so this is uh, what comes to most people's minds. And uh, this is, I'm sorry that I couldn't be here yesterday, but it seems that this is also what has been debated um, a lot yesterday and also um, in the previous talk is the idea that collective emotions seem to be closely associated to crowds of people, to masses and gatherings. And I think that is, of course, an absolutely um, valid and, and, and fruitful understanding of collective emotions. However, I think that this is not the only understanding and not the only useful understanding of what collective emotions are or what we mean when we use the term collective emotion. So if you, um, I guess all of you will remember um, this picture that uh, went viral um, across the media when uh, Anders um, Breivik uh, went on a killing spree on the island of Utøya um, in uh, 2011. And what you could read um, in, in the media coverage was that um, uh, all across Europe, people are in despair, um, people are grieving, people are devastated, people are indignated um, of what has been happening and what uh, um, regarding the crimes um, that Anders Breivik committed. And I think it is, um, it is pretty reasonable to also, um, in those cases, talk about collective emotions, although clearly they are pretty different things compared to the things that are going on um, in masses and gatherings. And a third example, um, this, is, um, this is a campaign, this is a poster of a campaign by the, um, by the US and British Allied Forces after World War II, um, and it says, diese Schandtaten eure Schuld, so that means your uh, what's the English word? Your, your crimes um, and your guilt. And here, I think the fascinating thing is uh, what is happening. It, it's still different from the second example and, of course, also different from the first example. So what is done here is an artistic, um, discursive means of highlighting people's um, collective identity and then attributing a specific kind of emotion with a clear normative stance for the things that you did, all of you should experience guilt. And I think um, why I'm using those examples, because I think it's, it's, it's fruitful and we can, maybe that's, I mean, of course, open to debate, but I think we can, in all those cases, um, talk about collective emotions. I think all those cases I would um, understand as forms of collective emotions, and I'm going to explain why, and I hope um, that might be a fruitful understanding. So that my point of departure is uh, the simple question, uh, what do we mean by collective emotions? If in fact, um, usually we would refer to those cases as collective emotions. So does that make sense? Or do we have to come up with very different terms? Because those things are so different that it doesn't make sense to use the term collective emotions. Just, just as, as we just heard, that it might not make sense to use the term contagion because it, it, it aims at explaining everything and then explains nothing. So is that also the case um, for the term uh, of collective emotions? That could be the question. So I think we can come to terms with those different examples by understanding collective emotions. And so I'm a sociologist. My background is more in understanding, yeah, larger patterns um, of behavior and of feelings that don't necessarily have to happen within 
within crowds and within gatherings. So that was the idea that we can understand, the question, can we understand collective emotions as um, what I call a synchronous convergence in effective responding across individuals towards the same eliciting event. I'm deliberately using the term effective responding here because I'm not really sure whether all these examples, kind of aside from, from the discursive side, actually produce collective, discrete, and distinct emotions. But what I think is that they somehow produce similar, more basic effective stances or effective kinds of respondings that could be maybe described along the, the dimensions of, let's say, valence and arousal, which would be the typical um, ways to describe that, maybe potency in addition. So, and then um, a second condition is more debatable, I'm not really sure about it, is I think what we need is the mutual awareness of this kind of respondent, or even, or maybe even only the imagination thereof. So this, th there needs to be an aspect of mutuality, I think, Right? We, we have to be aware that others are um, responding to something in a similar way. So if, if it's completely disconnected from each other, I, I don't think, or I think it stops to make sense to use the, the notion of collective emotion. So how can we explain the generation of collective emotions and what contributes to this presumed convergence in effective responding? Um, I think there are many um, different kinds of mechanisms and processes at play here. And um, uh, to hoping not to overstretch that example, um, again, is this is a gathering after um, the Charlie Hebdo attacks in Paris. And here, of course, what we see is, of course, the gathering and the crowd aspect of collective emotion. So we could say, well, people um, seem to share um, and experience a collective emotion here. Um, but then there are other things. Um, I mean, people are participating in rituals on themselves. They're lighting candles, going to places, mourning, and so on and so forth. And that clearly takes out some of the aspect of those crowd dynamics, but still somehow contributes to the generation or um, yeah, to the maintenance of some kind of um, collective emotional state. I think another often underappreciated sphere of influence is politics, is people pursuing certain political strategies in order to generate certain kinds of feelings and also in order to legitimize or delegitimize certain strands of political action. Um, another realm of influence, um, I think, is the arts, the ways in which um, artists in literature, in music, in film, talk about and portray um, the right way to feel in a specific situation, or the way in which you are expected to feel in a specific situation, the way in which you should appraise a certain event. And finally, of course, I think um, uh, that's, that's, that's pretty obvious, is, uh, is media coverage that brings most of those things to some kind of larger audience that does not need to be together in some kind of um, crowd or mass. So the objectives would be to identify mechanisms of collective emotion elicitation. I'm primarily focusing on elicitation. To count, I'm trying to account for different levels of explanation, try to link those levels and provide some related and suggestive evidence that has not been, is not explicitly used to test any of those theoretical propositions, but that was the research that I was um, conducting until now. So, and I will do that along four lines. I think those are things that help us to make sense of collective emotions, um, including all the examples that I've mentioned. One are social appraisals. The second thing is um, uh, the outcomes of um, social and collective identity. A third mechanism certainly is co-presence um, and, and contagion. Um, no matter whether we can call it this way or not. And, um, and then, of course, uh, of course, a fourth dimension um, is symbolic orders and what, what uh, others have called the politics of emotion. OK, how, how do I think um, social appraisals can contribute um, to this um, uh, synchronous convergence in effective responding? So as you all know, um, appraisal theories um, pretty straightforwardly assume um, that emotions result from interpretations of events in relation to one's beliefs, desires, and, and, and larger concerns. Um, and the concept of social appraisals now assumes that um, 
uh, that appraisals can be socially distributed and socially shared. Um, for example, in that the input to such an appraisal process comes from other actors, right? Other actors providing the necessary information for you to experience an emotion in the first place. And then the question, of course, would be, who are those others? And I mean, as we know, we all live in social networks that are um, hierarchically structured and so on and so forth. So there could be the emergence of some kinds of patterns from where you get that kind of input um, for appraisal processes. They can be socially learned, and you can even adopt appraisal results um, from different socialization agents and that people tell you that your parents might tell you, okay, you have to be afraid of the people that live on the other side of the street, right? That would be the idea of, okay, you need to appraise these and those things and event in a specific way. And then the idea would be that a certain emotion goes along with that. And they can be legitimized and supported by concordant appraisals of others. So if I'm appraising a, a, a situation in a certain way, and I'm seeing that others are doing the same, that in a sense legitimizes my way uh, of emotionally responding to a certain event. And that might contribute, that is the idea, to this um, convergence in effective responding. And now, I mean, this is what, what, what I've learned from looking at the social psychology literature. And now, the idea from a sociological perspective would be to scale this up a little more in the sense that we could even say, well, that we could even talk about socially shared cognitive appraisal structures. Um, and here, what the sociology um, of, um, of attitudes, for example, has shown um, that we can talk about or that we can justify the assumption that appraisals are based on socially shared patterns of beliefs, desires, values, and knowledge. And they differ um, across different groups. They differ across social strata. They differ across nation state societies, and so on and so forth. So, this is where collective emotions can be produced based on those principles. We have, we have to have in mind a specific view of what kind of collective are we talking about. Are we talking about a nation state, a supranational entity, a work team, um, a family, a community, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. And those things have in fact been discussed in early appraisal theories, but they have somehow remained marginal. Okay, here is some suggestive evidence. Um, what we did is a study on the effective meanings of um, concepts. And we had 900 um, concepts um, and used a representative sample of the German population. And we, we let our respondents um, rate those concepts on the three basic dimensions of effective meaning, that is valence, potency, and arousal. And what we wanted to see is whether there is some kind of, whether first there is consensus in the effective meanings of social concepts. And the assumption here would be, if in fact there is such a consensus, then there is a certain likelihood that given certain events, and that people share those effective meanings, right, that they might react in similar ways towards these events. And what you can see here is a cluster analysis um, for social identities concepts. And the interesting thing is that what you see here, that the, the, that the clusters, that they are generated not by the semantics, by the declarative semantics of the concepts, but they cluster around the effective meanings only. And then they are semantically meaningful. That is the interesting thing. I mean, people share a consensus in what concepts mean in effective terms. And um, so, for example, the, um, the, the bluish ones uh, are institutional authorities, green ones are uh, concepts related to community relations, and um, you know, what we call here the, the yellow ones, we call the social underachievers. There's concepts such as ex-husband and sinner, and so on and so forth. But the interesting thing is they cluster around the effective meanings, and then they are meaningful in a declarative way. Okay, um, I think a second um, process or mechanism that we can talk about, and that is um, integral, and I mean, I'm, I'm afraid that I'm boring you because I'm, I assume that you've heard a lot about that already, is, um, is the idea of the relevance of social and collective identity. And here, um, I would on the one hand refer to the uh, to concepts of group-based and intergroup emotions as they have been proposed, for example, um, by Mecki and others. And here the idea, the simple and straightforward idea is um, that, um, uh, that 
things like um, social and collective identity and processes of self-categorization that they promote or that they might promote the elicitation of emotions that you feel um, on behalf or in relation to some kind of group, whether that's a family, a team, a community, or a nation. And here, another idea would be that adopting a group's concern structure, and I think this is what contributes then to this larger scale convergence, adopting a, group, a group's concern structure that is of relevance to you pr may promote this kind of effective responding, right? And I think those things can well happen um, if somebody is in isolation. Right? So, for example, if I get a call that my favorite um, team um, scored, I might be happy without being in a crowd just because I have this kind of um, identity and I adopted the concern structure. Now, here, one of the suggestions would be how could we link that um, to um, other levels of analysis? And I think a fruitful concept here is Nico Freida's concept of sentiments and what I here call group-based sentiments. And um, he talks about sentiments as more enduring and mood-like affective dispositions, or even he uses the term emotional attitudes towards a social collective. And if those things, in fact, exist, um, and as he, he also suggests that they comprise appraisal dispositions and that they promote the elicitation of collective emotions of similar valence. So it's not just that you might have certain sentiments, but given a specific event that occurs, those sentiments make you more prone to, experience, uh, to experiencing a discrete emotion of similar valence. And so here the idea is that might also contribute to this um, yeah, larger scale convergence aspect. A third idea um, is, and we've also heard a lot about this, so I might skip <laughs> this, uh, this first slide. Um, so here, we, we, I think that there are two different understandings of the ways in which gatherings can work. I, I think my reading of the Le Bon literature is that here the idea is that things like emotional unity can occur in crowds um, uh, with, with very distinct beliefs and values, whereas the, my, my Durkheim reading would be that Durkheim held, okay, we need some commonality in values and in beliefs because his focus was in those shared uh, rituals that then produce collective effervescence, um, but I'm not going um, into the details here. What I'm more interested then here is, let's assume those things exist, um, where do other levels come in? And can we, can we kind of identify some, some kind of interplay between levels? And one idea would be, um, would be the influence of culture on facial expression. And what I found relevant here is the idea that culture shapes the expression and recognition um, of emotions and produces what Hilary Elfenbein has called facial dialects. And her idea is that those facial dialects produce an in, what she calls an in-group advantage in the recognition of facial expressions of emotions. So if this is in fact the case, and if we can say that facial expressions somehow contribute to I'm calling it for the time being contagion um, within crowds and gatherings, then my question or the idea would be, is there something like an in-group advantage in experiencing collective emotions? So that you experience collective emotions, more, that you're more likely to experience them in crowds um, that consist of people with similar cultural backgrounds than across groups or within groups that have been socialized in, 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 in very different ways in emotional terms. And um, I think another important thing here is the interplay also between what goes on in crowds and gatherings on the one hand and the more cognitive side in particular relating to group identities. And here um, I think one example is the study by Hopkins, Riker and, Al, uh, and others um, that has shown that collective identity in fact promotes effervescence and contagion. Um, but also, I think that also the reverse is true, that effervescence reinforces collective identity and socially shared appraisal structures. I think those links work in both ways, and that is one thing that um, we have been looking at um, uh, using a study on the, um, on the recent 
uh, World Cup, and we've that was well, it was quasi experimental design, you could say, and we were we've been asking people um, in how far they experience emotional entrainment um, during the World Cup, and then we looked at changes in the effective perception of nation related symbols because the idea is of course that those gatherings and rituals they that people experience collective effervescence and emotional entrainment, and then that has an effect on identity. And because it's a nation-based ritual, the idea was, or I mean, that would be Durkheim's proposition, right? That, that national identity should change. And this is, in fact, what we find. Of course, um, the effective perception at time one is the strongest predictor, but emotional um, entrainment is a highly significant predictor also when we control for gender and age. Okay, and um, the, final, um, the final dimension that I think is relevant to understanding collective emotions in this sense is um, our symbolic orders and politics of emotion. And, and then the more I'm thinking about this, I think this is one of the most relevant um, areas somehow, although, um, yeah, well, it's hard to grasp um, uh, in empirical research. I think one thing here is the, uh, the, the communication and sharing of emotion. I think that's closely linked to um, the interpersonal validation of emotional responding. So if I'm the only person responding emotionally in a certain way, um, well, then that's it. But it's a different thing when I'm sharing my experiences and others kind of validate the experience, saying, okay, well, this is the right way to feel. I felt the same. And this sharing of emotions, that is the idea, may in, in mid or longer terms also contribute um, to this effective um, uh, convergence that I've been talking about. Um, and interestingly, um, when this happens, not in, let's say, dyadic or close-knit, uh, dyadic interactions or close-knit groups, but when those processes of sharing emotions are disseminated, for example, through social media or through more traditional media. Another thing um, I think that is important and that goes closely together with this sharing. I mean, you could in fact say this kind of sharing maybe amounts to some kind of descriptive emotion norm in the sense that, okay, this is what we are experiencing and this is what is perceived to be the normal or regular way to experience emotion in a, a, or vis-a-vis -vis a specific event. Another thing is um, sociologists for some time have been um, studying um, emotion norms and those are simply social norms that explicitly um, refer to the experience and expression of emotions that the, the, the origins are in the sociology of work and organizations, but I think this might well be transferred um, to other uh, cases. And here, I think an interesting fact is that because those things are norms, they are usually closely tied to sanction in cases of violation. So what we have with the existence of emotion norms, um, some kind of social control um, of emotion that, that might in fact promote this kind of convergence. If this is a, a kind of behavior that has a normative dimension and you know that others are expecting from you to behave emotionally in a specific way and if it's even the case that you are sanctioned if you are deviating that as with any other norm-backed behavior too that might contribute to this convergence in behavior. I mean, that, that's one of the essence of social norms. Um, okay, and finally, we're trickling um, up, so to say. Um, I think what's relevant are um, uh, what uh, William Reddy, a historian of emotion, and Sarah Ahmed uh, have called emotion regimes. That's the Reddy concept and the politics of emotion. That's what Sarah Ahmed is writing about. And here the idea is simple when I first um, gave the example of the politicians uh, in the Charlie Hebdo attacks, um, I think the politics and political cultures um, are, are able to promote um, the experience of specific emotions. Um, I think one of the best examples um, is what we are, what we are seeing um, in Germany right now or, or across Europe when you're looking at right-wing populist parties because they are specifically adapt um, uh, uh, to well, yeah, to, to, to strategically um, induce a certain way of emotional responding. If you look at the Pegida movement in Germany, it's a specific way of responding in, in emotional terms towards immigrants and refugees, right? And this is, of course, politically 
um, utilized and, and, it, and it's used to back up a certain um, political position. And finally, um, uh, I, would be, uh, I would suggest that um, broader kinds of social and cultural practices play a role. Um, uh, one example would be the formation of effectively charged collective memories. Um, if you think about Jeffrey Alexander's concept of cultural traumas, um, thank you. Um, uh, he, he makes the example of the Holocaust. Um, and I, I think there is something to it that those effectively charged collective memories upon recall are able to again instill a specific and widely shared way of uh, experiencing uh, similar emotions. And um, I think Another realm, another area where, is this, where, where this is further reinforced, but not only this, but this also, of course, pertains to, um, I mean, how do, do group identities or collective identities arise? Um, how do um, shared appraisal structures arise? I think what is essential here um, are not only Oh, well, not, not only normative accounts, but also representations and portrayals and depictions of emotions in the arts, in literature, in music, or in discourse. Right? And uh, well, this is really very suggestive evidence, what I have in mind when I'm talking about um, the influence of culture. Um, and here is a study that we did on, uh, on uh, emotional cues in music. Um, and how far is music able to elicit emotions? And that was done with my colleague Glenn Schellenberg, and he's a music psychologist. And what we've been looking at were, was the, 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 what are the dominant emotional cues in uh, American popular music from 1965 to 2009? So is there a, well, you could even say a hegemony <laughs> in the emotions that are in the charts? And we looked at, we analyzed a thousand songs from the US uh, top, uh, top 40 uh, singles from the Billboard um, Hot 100 Year End Charts, and we analyzed them for mode and tempo, which are known to be the main emotion eliciting or emotion representing um, elements of music. And, uh, well, I'm skipping that one. I mean, what you can see here is uh, the um, percentage of, of songs in major mode, and of major mode songs, um, the music psychologists tell me that major mode is associated with happy responding, whereas minor mode is commonly associated with more sad responding. And the same is true for tempo. Um, faster songs are usually associated with more happy responding, and slower songs are commonly associated with more sad responding be that as it may, so this is um, what has been happening. And that was, in fact, our hypothesis, that if, you, if you're looking at music from the charts in the 60s, um, they, are, um, they are pretty fast, and they're almost always happy sounding. They're almost like children's songs. And that was the initial idea for the project, that when you're listening to music in the charts, it's, it's pretty different. And, and this is what you can see, in fact, um, the, um, uh, the percentage of, of songs in major mode is almost half the amount uh, as in the 60s, and there is a significant slowing down of the songs uh, in the charts. Um, but what you can see here, um, this regression shows changes in tempo as a function of the recording year. Um, but the interesting thing here is that the, um, so the uh, rectangles are representing songs uh, the songs in major mode and the circles are representing the songs in minor mode, um, as well as, uh, as the slopes. Um, but what you can see here is that the slowing down of songs is driven by songs in minor mode and not by those in major mode. And that means that we don't have a simple, uh, a simple development, so more happy music in the charts, but what we see is the cues are becoming increasingly more ambivalent. Right? So we have an, an increasing percentage of songs with mixed cues and mixed emotional responding. Now, if you look at cultural studies, people doing um, or talking about emotions, this is what they tell you. Um, they would tell you um, that we are increasing things like individualization and so on and so forth. They, um, they try to get us away from simple black and white styles of responding in emotional terms, but to more complex and, um, and well, ambivalent ways of uh, responding in emotional terms. Well, but this is, of course, it's highly speculative. There's no 
in no way direct evidence for the for the proposals that I've made, but I think it it it, it serves well to illustrate the idea that I have in mind when I'm talking about the arts and literature uh, and so on and so forth. Okay, thank you very much. So I think my talk is going to be a bit different from uh, the previous one in one crucial aspect is that I don't have data to show you. Um, so what I'm going to do is to present you a project uh, we are aiming at doing about uh, the attacks at uh, the Bataclan. And what we are interested in is how our stages of the Bataclan individually and collectively behave over the course of the attacks and crucially and more importantly, the general behavior, the exhibit, the shot, the displayed, and the interplay between self-preservative and pro-social tendencies at various stages of the attacks. We have, we've got no data yet, and it is a research proposal which has received uh, financial support from the Recherche Attentat Scheme from the uh, French National Center for Scientific Research. It's a project we are about to start, and feedback and suggestions are most welcome about the procedure. So as you know, there were attacks in Paris in uh, November 2015, and more particularly six uh, quasi-simultaneous attacks by small armed groups between 9 o'clock and 1 o'clock in the morning in the northeast of Paris, and in total, casualties were of 130 people killed and around 350 people injured after the attacks. And we were particularly interested in what happened at uh, Le Bataclan, which is a concert hall uh, in the northeast of Paris. Uh, because that's the longest and most deadly of the six attacks, uh, 1,500 people attended the concert, which started around 7.30 p.m. At 9.40, the terrorist group composed of three armed individuals, arrived at the Bataclan and killed uh, bouncers outside the concert hall. At 10 p.m., one, one of the terrorists was killed by a police officer. And at um, midnight, around midnight, it was the start of the um, intervention by the French special forces. So everything stopped at around uh, 1 o'clock in the morning on the 14th of December. And during this... Um, this, this lag between 10 o'clock and 1 o'clock in the morning, uh, 89 people were killed in a, what I could call an ad libitum shooting, uh, and that terrorists were actually shooting people in an ad libitum fashion in some, in some sort, and dozens of people were seriously injured. If we try to understand uh, and to assess the nature of the threat, uh, what we can say is that there seemed to be high mobility of the armed group in the concert hall. So they started, uh, they entered by this particular entry. During around 20 minutes, uh, they were shooting at people who were in this part of the, of the concert hall. Then the police intervened, one policeman intervened 20 minutes later, and then they climbed at the balcony and uh, up to 1 p.m took all stages. So what's important, I think, to, to retain from this very specific slide is that the threat is highly mobile. Another critical aspect to, to assess the nature of the threat is to, 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 to realize that escape routes were somehow limited, and victims' knowledge of those exit routes is left undetermined. Another crucial aspect when we look at um, the interviews of survivors from uh, the attacks at the Bataclan is that there seem to be little exchanges and interaction between the victims and the armed group. Uh, there were many of two types. The uh, armed group tentatively explained their motivation, so it was in terms of the French uh, army operations against ISIS in Syria. And they also used victims as human uh, shields against the police forces later. So those two types of interactions were the main, apparently the main interactions between the armed group and uh, the hostages. And one also important point is uh, that 
The kind of threat seemed to be uh, somehow blind. As I said, there was some sort of a libitum shooting. Uh, somebody who was inside the Bataclan, the balcony, uh, uh, posted a message on Facebook saying, well, they are slaughtering us one by one. And in fact, the survival seemed to depend crucially on a fast move from the police forces. In other words, there's no internal dispositions in uh, the, 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 the hostages to be able to get out of the room. They need the, 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 police, the police forces to intervene to get out of this uh, situation. So there's nothing much to do, in fact, for them but to wait. So if we sum up this contextual factor which help us assess and understand the nature of the threat, it is highly mobile, it is a blind threat, as I said, a libitum, slaughter, there are limited exit routes, lim little communication between attackers and victims, and survival is dependent on external factors, which are the police forces. So the question we wanted to ask is how the hostages of the Bataclan individually and collectively behaved over the course of the attacks? The general behavior and the interplay between self-preservative and pro-social tendencies and the emergence, very emergence of those pro-social motifs over the course at various stages of the attacks. A typical answer to that would be, well, probably everybody panicked and tried to save his or her own life at the expense of others. And this is what is to be expected, in fact, uh, from, for, for if we were to ask lay people in the street, is that you've got panic and pre uh, prevalence of self preservative actions, such as pushing and trampling others to access the exits, or using other physical bodies as shields when exit cannot be reached and when you've got to wait for the police forces to intervene. So what do we hear by panic is difficult to define as most definitions are non-empirical. It's a lay term and it's present in everyday uh, discourse. And as we've heard before, it is even used by uh, survivors of emergency contexts despite evidence of calm and prudent behavior from themselves. So panic may then be used to refer to a general lack of information about what's happening. Okay, I don't know what's happening, so I was actually panicked. And other were panicking as well because they had no clue of what was going on. A tentative definition would be excessive and groundless fear, which leads to the adoption of irrational course of action to access a state of physical safety, which would mean exaggerated beliefs about the threat and other reactions. And if we try to give a broader definition, I think there are three core components of the panic, which is an affective component, which is very negative in violence, of high intensity. There is an epistemic component, which is that the subject believes that something dangerous is happening in the environment, the exit routes are limited, there is a chance to escape, because if there's no chance to escape, then you don't, you don't, you lose up and you don't panic. And there is a motivational component, finally, which is a willingness to reach a safer place by whichever means, including at the expense of others. So if X believes that there is a danger in the closed environment, if X knows that the exit routes are limited, X will panic. This is classically the entrapment dilemma. Shall I let others leave before me or shall I rush to the exit, knowing that every second which is passed may uh, increase the probability that I will stay in that room and die? So we should expect prevalence of self-preservative actions when collectively exposed to threats, which is a panic model of escape behavior, which assumes that people threatened by entrapment will revert automatically to primitive, highly emotional, irrational behavior, and important self-preservative, selfish behavior. As uh, we know, this is actually wrong. Uh, that's not what's happening. And there are evidence from many, many reports. Uh, one an uh, impressive one was uh, reported by Brooks and Fayy about the uh, World Trade Center attacks in, in the US. Um, they, they took uh, reports, first-hand reports from newspaper and media, and even from interviews, of uh, four, around 400 survivors. And what they found is that if people were well aware of the risk, there was a great deal of mutual help, uh, and people were said to be calm. People were also, one third of the respondents say people were, other people were upset, which means that actually panic was an individual component, but there was no sort of spread or contagious disease of the panic among uh, participants. 
And there are many other reports that draw similar conclusions. So why don't people panic in those situations? There are three broad classes of explanation, it seems. One is that there is the maintenance of everyday social norms, such as helping the under, uh, elderly. Uh, and there is this uh, famous study by Johnson when uh, one of the respondents said that while the, while the fire was raging and while people were apparently rushing towards the exit, uh, she took the time to tell off somebody who was actually stepping on her dress. So it means something about the, the state of panic that those people were apparently not uh, experiencing. Another uh, idea is that affiliation is in fact a primitive reaction threat. And um, we have good evidence that social clustering and affiliation are indeed primary reaction to threats. Uh, we found some uh, nice picture from uh, the Fear Factory, which is an haunting house uh, sort of um, in a fun fair in, in the Niagara Falls in Canada, and what you can clearly see is that people are actually trying to grip one another. That's the main response in front of that threat. It's difficult to know what exactly is the nature of the threat because uh, this very uh, fun factory, fear factory, doesn't want to communicate about the threat, not to screw up uh, future visits. But um, if we look at months by months, uh, which seems to be a, a change in the type of threat which uh, participants are exposed to, you see the same kind of response consistently, trying to grip others. So social clustering seems to be a very, very primitive reaction to threat, immediate reactions to threat. Another um, key component is to explain, well, in fact, uh, this guy uh, probably know one another, and from what I've heard from uh, this fear factory, they actually make people go in group of people who are familiar with one another. So maybe uh, if they were unknown to one another, they wouldn't display this behavior. But in fact, what you see from John's uh, and, and Steve's uh, papers is that, well, clearly, prosociality is somehow universal. The very fact that you're exposed to a similar threat makes you uh, experience a common fate, and then it's going to create a common social identity and collective resilience. And there's evidence from a paper by John in 2008 where they surveyed, uh, uh, I think, 11 uh, disasters. And what they found is that people reported a greater feeling of togetherness with others, which would um, then be identification with others, reporting more mutual help and less selfish behavior.